Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel like Tom Jones with this microphone. Does anybody remember Tom Jones? <laughs> it's not unusual. The guy had some pipes, didn't he? He had some real pipes. Uh, those of you who do seminars, don't ever use this microphone. It's the worst thing in the world, OK? So just a little tip for you right there. Always use a lavalier mic if you can. This is a nightmare because you end up doing this the whole time, and then they miss your wisdom. So lesson number one. I'm going to take you up to 40,000 feet. You've, you've heard some incredible things from some incredible speakers during this cruise. And uh, I want to, um, I just want to take you up to a little bit of a higher view for the next few minutes. And maybe we can get you back on schedule. I think we're running a little late, so I don't want to short circuit anybody. But um, this is important because I think the financial services industry has changed. And I don't know what you all do. I'm not 100% I'm not clear. I don't, I don't think everybody does the same thing as everyone else. Uh, I come from Wall Street. I come from the wirehouse world, if you will. And, and uh, any wirehouse folks here? OK. So what, what firm? You were with Merrill? Yeah. That, that's sort of my world. I have 30 years on Wall Street. And um, I, I can tell you from that perspective, uh, their world is dying. I don't know if you have a sense of this, but we, we can talk more about this. But 40,000 foot perspective, uh, I want to thank RME because, frankly, none of us would be here without them. And, and they've put together some incredible uh, programs and ideas. I'm very happy to be affiliated with them. It's been a great relationship. So, so thank you for putting this together. Call it whatever you want. Transformation, rebirth, evolution, revolution, maturing. I think every industry goes through changes. And just you know, quick historical perspective, the, the, the music industry. When did this change big time? Anybody? The, the last record album I bought was when Peter Frampton came alive. I, did, I had not bought music until they came out with the iPod. And it was a, uh, now I've got seven of these damn things. If, if somebody could show me how to actually sync them, that would be a wonderful thing. I can't quite figure that out, but it's okay. I mean, this, this was a revolution. The computer industry changed dramatically. I think we're all aware of this. This has been a mind boggling shift. In fact, somebody said, I, I was at a meeting and I, I can't, don't quote my statistics. By the way, don't ever quote a statistic that I give you because most of them are gross exaggerations or made up on the spot. Um, but, but the statistic I heard from someone else was that if the airline industry had progressed as fast as the computer industry over the last 20 years, a flight from Los Angeles to Paris would cost one cent first class one second it would take you. It's like beaming. You'd be beaming, okay? Very powerful transition, major, major life change for the country. The military's changed quite a bit. Anybody remember Top Gun? Yeah, those days are over. Now Top Gun flies out of an Air Force base in Missouri. They fly drones over Afghanistan, and they drop bombs by computer. And there's a big controversy in the Air Force that the guy sitting behind the computer screen actually gets flight pay. Does that seem fair? It does to me, baby. Keep bombing. Bomb the hell out of them. Pay these people whatever they're worth. I don't really care. But the industry has changed. Everything changes. Our business has changed, too. Our business changed for a variety of reasons. Let me skip through some of this. Technology advancement, client demands, changes in tastes, internal crisis legislation, societal pressure. We've got all of them. The financial services industry has changed because of all of these. Our industry basically started in 1792, and for 188 years, we were only for the wealthy. We were an industry for the wealthy run by the sons and nephews of the wealthy. Okay? And then in the 1980s, something happened. The 1980s saw an explosion. Anybody know why? Did you listen to Harry Dent's presentation the other day? Do you understand? I mean, forget the market calls. Forget the market calls. I know people want to get wrapped up in you know, Dow Jones 40. Forget all that. The, the, the underlying power of what he discusses and what he teaches is so strong that you can't, you can't hide from it. In the 1980s, something interesting happened to the largest generation in the history of Earth. 
the largest generation in the history of Earth were the baby boomer generation. You understand that? Okay? The baby boomers started to make money. They hit their peak earning phase. And at the same time they started to make money, they began to invest money. Look at what happened to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and this is not a precise graph, don't quote this exactly, but this is basically what it did. It went from 800 on the Dow to 12,000 on the Dow. 800 to 12,000. Because the baby boomers started pumping money into the marketplace. Massive growth until 2008, and then the financial crisis hit at the worst possible time for the boomer. The financial crisis hit us when we were most vulnerable, naked and swimming in the dark. Couldn't quite get the resolution so that you could see she's naked, but, she, but in the movie, if you've seen the movie, she was actually naked and it was nighttime. Anybody remember the movie Jaws? <laughs> okay. All you have to hear to be terrified is da -da. That's it. I, if, if I want to scare the crap out of my wife, I walk up behind her and I go, da -da. <laughs> Very scary. The baby boomers were swimming in this ocean of confusion, this sea of terror called the investment world, and up out of the depths comes this shark that basically kicks our butts, and now we're in danger. Our clients are in danger. And I, I focus on, and some of you are not boomers, I recognize this. Some of you are younger, you're Gen Xers. You will be eventually building relationships with Gen Xer clients. Some of you are working with retirees who are actually beyond the boomer years. I, I get it. We actually, we actually if, you, if you run the numbers, we actually have five generations of clients out there. It's kind of a rare moment in history when there's five distinct generations. The oldest are dying, they're gone. The World War II's and the Eisenhower's are gone. The boomers are the sweet spot. They're the sweet spot because there's a lot of them and they've got all the money at the moment. That's going to last for 15 more years and then Gen X will be coming. There's a big difference between Gen X and the boomers. The biggest difference, well, the, there's two gigantic differences. Number one is Gen X is half the size of the boomer generation. Half the size of the boomer generation, okay? So that means there's a lot fewer of them to buy the stuff that the boomers want to get rid of at some point. So did Harry talk about real estate? Did he, talk, did, he, did he help you understand that real estate's going to be flat for 20 years? Are you clear on that? Because if you're not clear on that, get very clear. And I don't, I'm not trying to do the Harry Dent presentation here. But I, I just want you to understand that this is very important stuff. Boomers are in danger because we bought everything we could find. We leveraged ourselves to the hilt. We overexposed ourselves to risk. We have a distorted sense of financial reality. What does that mean? Distorted sense of reality means that when we first started investing, when the boomers first began to invest, they saw for the first 18 years of their investment world, they saw a gigantic bull market. And so they think on some level that that's normal. During their first formative years as investors, they were exposed to the greatest bull market in the history of the country. And so many of them are still waiting for 20% returns. And that's probably never going to happen again. So this distorted reality is damaging the boomer generation to a great degree. They still have, they still have a proclivity, an internal proclivity toward risk. They haven't yet made the transition out of risk because they think at some point they're going to be rewarded. Applied materials is going to go back to 300 bucks a share. Any of you have stock and bond clients? Is that part of your world at all? No? Okay. I come from the Wall Street world. That is our world. I ran a mutual fund family in Boston for 10 years. We had a great family of mutual funds. I'd, you probably have never heard of the company. It's called Natixis. Natixis is a giant conglomerate of mutual fund families. We own Loomis Sales. We own the Oakmark Funds. We, it's a $2 trillion money management firm that nobody's ever heard of, which is fine. We liked it that way. But we had some very great funds. The problem was we were running these funds in the late 1990s and clients were calling us up saying, get me out of that fund, it only went up 48%. It only went up 48%. Get me that Munder Net Net Fund. 
Does anybody remember the, the, the net, net? No, you, probably, you may not. Uh, this is not your world. But the, the Munder net, net fund went up 110% a year for two straight years. And people thought that was normal. It's insane, OK? Damaged by the media. The media is the great Satan. I appreciate that RME is buying media time. Frankly, I wish you wouldn't, because I'd like to see them all go out of business. I think the greatest crime ever perpetrated on the American investor is CNBC. I think they've spread more evil, more mistrust, more confusion than anything else, more undermining of our relationships. If I had two bullets in my gun, I would take two shots, Kramer and Susie Orman. Don't miss. Don't miss. And I might try to take Kramer and Susie out with a ricochet shot and s <laughs> save one if I can. I got another target in mind. I won't tell you who that is. They'd probably arrest me. No, 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 no. Mistrustful of everything. And for the first time in our lives, for the first time in our lives, the baby boomer generation is dealing with a new emotion called fear. Why are we scared? We're scared because we're getting older. Everyone except for Steve. Spike there. Good God, man. What are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, come on. No, he looks good. I mean, guy, look at John McCloskey. Where's John McCloskey? I mean, God, he looks like a linebacker. I mean, what is, everybody's getting in shape. Am I missing something? Is this, I thought the fitness thing was a fad. I mean, I figured it'd be over by now. You know? I'm, I'm skipping the whole fitness thing. I just, I refuse to go. I'm 56. I look 66. I'm happy with that. I really am. Be what you are, you know? God. So we've got fear going. And in the face of fear, we need a leader. We need somebody to emerge. In the face of our Jaws analogy here, a hero emerges. Someone steps up to the plate with a gun and says, get out of the water. I'm here to protect you. I love this movie. This movie has so many powerful metaphors. There's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in here. We are calling this the new why, a new why for a new world. I think our industry, because we're in this transition phase, I think we're going to look very different in five years than we did five years ago. I think the product selling part of our business is over. No one wants to be sold stuff. And I, look, I recognize that we still think of ourselves as salespeople. I'm proud to think of myself as a salesperson. I think as salespeople, we can understand the power of selling and, and the benefits of all that. I get it. I get it. I'm immersed in it. I drank the Kool-Aid. I'm with you. I don't think the public thinks that way. I think the public does not want a salesperson. I think they want something different. And I, I've come up with what I think is a new model for this. And it may or may not work for you. It has some legs. I call this the lifeguard metaphor. Let me take you through this. Simon Sinek wrote this book called Start With Why. He says, most people start with what? What do you do? Somebody says, what do you do? And, and, and every speaker up here has posed this question to you. And I've, I've really enjoyed this because it's been great feedback and great insight. What do you do? You're at a cocktail party. You're standing in line to get a drink. Somebody says, so what do you do? And, and we're supposed to have some magic answer, right? We're supposed to have something clever, something you know, that gets them to reach into their pocket, pull out their checkbook, and go, when can I come see you? I've got money. It, it doesn't work like that. Nothing works like that. I get it. We've been focused so much on the what, I think it's hurt us. We've missed the bigger picture. You take it one layer inside, and you go from the what to the how. We spend a tremendous amount of time and energy on the how. Firms across the industry spend millions of dollars on improving processes, systems. You, we've got the how really well done. Okay, We've got money figured out. I don't think anybody here needs more of an education on how to manage money, do you? Did you wake up this morning going, please, dear God, bring me another product? I don't think you did. I don't think most financial professionals do. I think we need help in a different way. I think we need a new why, and that's what this is about. For 200 years, our industry's why has been about money. It still is about money, but now we need something more. And I think this is a symbol and an effort that will resonate with your people. I want to be a lifeguard. Our new why is about protecting people, watching over them, caring for them, guiding them, keeping them safe when they are the most vulnerable. 78 million Americans are about to jump into the water. Many of them are already in the water. 
They're naked, they're scared, they don't know how to swim, and they're about to get their asses chewed off by a shark. Did I say asses? I'm sorry. I apologize. I heard Tony Robbins, John was telling me that Tony Robbins cursed the other day at this big meeting. Tony Robbins using the S word in a meeting. I'm excited about that. That might give me permission to be very vulgar again. I've been very happy. I've really tried to clean up my act quite a bit, and it's hurting me. It takes a lot of energy to not curse. I'm from New York, for God's sake. Financial lifeguard on duty, let's talk about this. The lifeguard model allows you to differentiate yourself, be assertive and confident, take control and act boldly. Interesting thought about being a lifeguard. One of the, has, has anyone ever actually been a real, like a Red Cross type lifeguard? Okay, stay with me. When, did they have water when you were a lifeguard? <laughs> I'm serious, it wasn't, wasn't the earth like a big flaming ball back there? I'm totally kidding, I apologize. And who said shot the hippopotamus with an arrow? Do you, did you believe him? I mean, what a, what a line of crap that is. <laughs> well, I believe the hippopotamus was there. I, I don't believe the arrow was there. You shot him with a nuclear-tipped arrow. I don't think you could kill a hippopotamus with an arrow, do you? All right, I'm not buying that. But anyway, forget that. Um, one of the things they teach you in lifeguard school, and tell me if this is wrong, OK? One of the things they teach you is how to take control of a drowning person. Why? What will a drowning person do to you? You swim over, a drowning person is going to drag you down. They're going to try to climb up to you floating. You're the floating thing next to them. You have to learn how to, you actually have to knock out the drowning person, possibly, to save their lives. That seems odd. What's the metaphor for our industry? You go to a client and you say, listen, I've got a great program that saves your life, saves your family's financial future. What do they want to say? What are the fees on that? What are the fees? Susie says it's too expensive. I have a simple rule, okay? I row my boat, my lifeboat, into the sea of drowning people. I drop a ladder and I beg you to get on board. You want to argue with me about the fees? I give you one chance. One chance to save yourself. If not, I take the oar, I hit you over the head with it. <laughs> get away from my boat, okay? Because I got more people to save. And maybe I'm wrong. Is this too harsh? I don't know. This is crazy. Maybe this bothers you. Maybe it upsets you to say to somebody, get the hell away from my boat. I have no time to waste with you. In our business, in my, in my side of the industry, I, I can't tell if I'm loud. Am I loud enough? Can you hear me? No. Yeah. <laughs> in, our, in my side of the industry, you know, you're, you're prospecting somebody for months and months. I mean, it could take months to get a prospect to convert to a client at some point at least on the investment side, okay? So I've got a guy, six months, I'm working on him. He's in the office today. He's about to sign the check. He's going to sign the transfer form. Something's going to happen, but he comes with Money Magazine. And he puts Money Magazine on the desk, and he says, Frank, before we get started, well, what are the 12B1 fees? What's the alpha on this portfolio? A salesperson has to deal with that question. A salesperson has to say, well, Bob, let me show you. We're using multiple money managers, so it's actually a blended alpha. And let me explain how this, stop, stop. That's sales conversation. Lifeguard conversation, completely different. Bob, you're asking a jackass question. You're asking a question that even if I gave you the answer, you wouldn't understand what I was saying. So here's the deal. For some reason, you think I'm trying to sell you something. You haven't figured out that I'm here to save your life. I'm going to go to the men's room. I'll be back in two minutes. Get in the lifeboat or get the hell out of my office. Okay, harsh. I totally get it. I get it. I'm going to tell you something. A little bit of assertiveness on our part will help your people. A little bit of aggressiveness and a little bit of confidence, and there are many vulgar terms for this, but, you know, call them stones, call them guts, call them whatever you want, all right? I think right now our industry is missing some of that, and I think they need that from us. They need us to hit them over the head and say, get in the damn boat. Stop arguing with me over nonsense. Let me save you, because I can't save you till you're in the boat. I'm crazy, what can I tell you, all right? That's me, the lifeguard. The imagery works, it's much easier. Photoshop is much easier than actually losing the weight, so I've learned to ch change things around. God, wouldn't that be nice, though? I mean, is that even possible? John, is that, is that, that's what you look like, right? You stud muffin, you, good God. Okay. 
Oh, and by the way, when you're really a lifeguard, nobody asks, what are your fees? When they really think you're there to save their life, they don't give you a hard time over what this thing costs because they believe in you. And Steve said this, there's only one product you ever have to sell to a fellow human being. What is it? 270 pounds of Sicilian obnoxiousness from Staten Island. This is what I sell. Okay, you like this? We got a relationship. You don't like this? Go get the annuity from somebody you do like. Because products, products will never differentiate you. I can get what you have from anybody else. The only thing that differentiates you is yourself, and you've got to learn how to do that. Okay, so what does it take to be a lifeguard? It takes 10 things. So let me cover these with you in the next 14 hours. No, this is impossible. Let me take a few minutes, highlight a couple of these. If you want to learn more, there's that one pager in the back that will help you. It, it synopsizes the 10 steps to becoming a lifeguard. And there's a whole bunch of takeaway tools that you can access for free on my website. I have a website. I've got a lot of stuff on there. If you go to macellegroup.com, macellegroup.com, there's a section on the home page called Resource Vault. Resource Vault. Go to the Resource Vault and download everything. It's all free. And, and there's uh, articles, there's workbooks, there's a lot of stuff that will help you, and I'll highlight a few things for you today. So I think that'll be useful. Okay. Oh, and there's a nice mug. We have a nice Financial Lifeguard Academy mug. I love mugs, and this is big. You can actually cook soup in this thing. It's nice. No, I did it. I, you could take a can of Campbell's soup, the small can, and you can't put a lot of water in it, but who the hell puts water in it anyway? So Campbell's soup fits right into this. Very nice. Okay. The first takeaway is called the self-analysis, the advisor self-analysis. This, this is interesting. This is a quiz that you could take today. How many of you have done this? Has anybody done this? I mean, some of you, I, I know I've seen you before. I've seen you 50,000 times. It's good to see you again. Bottom line is, take the quiz. The quiz is the 10 steps to success, the way I've described them, and questions, and you'll get a score. There's three questions for each. You'll get a score somewhere between zero and, well, you can't get zero, but somewhere between 50 and 150. 150, anything over 135, you're lying. Take it again. Nobody gets that high. Okay, somewhere in here, you're okay, very good, average, not so good. If you score below 80, go to resume.com, find a new job. <laughs> this may not be the career for you. It's possible. So we start with conviction. Conviction is the rudder of your ship. We're on a ship, this ship has a rudder. What does a rudder do for the ship? Keeps it on course, gives it a direction. And when the wind and the waves, God help me, because I was stuck in my cabin for two days, I, I, I don't know what it is. I get very seasick the first night. I apologize if I haven't seen anybody at dinner, because I've been hiding in my cabin. And I haven't really been eating, which is very upsetting to me, because they say, get on a cruise, you can eat like crazy. So today, I'm eating my face off. If you want to see me, I will be in the lounge right above us, standing next to the buffet table. So I plan to eat four days worth of food today. The rudder of your ship, it keeps you on course. Download the conviction pyramid. The conviction pyramid will help you build conviction. Nobody can give you conviction. Okay, conviction comes from inside. You gotta build it, but there's three steps to building conviction. Core principles are the base of the pyramid. Strategies and tactics go up, and then trusted advisors. What you need are core principles, which are things that are timeless and are always true always true. No matter what the market does, no matter what the economy does, these things are true. What do you believe? What do you believe about money? What do you believe about clients, about working as a team, about marketing yourself? Core principles. Strategies and tactics are timely ideas, timely, that make sense now. And trusted advisors are people who help you, people you can rely on to tell you valuable stuff. Very important, because in our profession, you can't build conviction alone. You need help. You need help. This is a complex business. There are a lot of nuances up here. You've had great speakers for the last two days. They're all part of your trusted advisor team. They should be. This is the conviction workbook. You can download this from the website. It'll help you build some conviction. And, and, and there's a lot of stuff on here, multiple pages. But it's very good stuff that'll help. Then you need passion. If conviction is the rudder of the ship, what's passion? Passion's the engine. Passion's the propeller. Passion's the motivating force. 
Passion is what wakes you up in the morning. And passion to me is an activity question. An activity question. This is very important. Stay with me. Because if you don't learn anything, this is the one thing I want you to learn, okay? You've got to work from passion. You've got to do things that turn you on. You've got to eliminate things that turn you off. When you reach a certain point of success in any profession, you don't get more successful by doing more things. You actually get more successful by doing fewer things. Does that make sense? I'm guessing some of you realize this, okay? Robert talked about this the other day, called it unique ability. The concept of unique ability came from Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach. Has anybody been to strategic coach? Handful of people. Dan Sullivan, one of, one of the great geniuses in our world, came up with this very simple concept called unique ability. You take all your life skills, all your skills, and you narrow down the things you do. Super successful people don't do everything, they focus. How do they focus? They only do things they're very good at, they only do things they love to do, and they only do things that make money when they do them. And in the middle of these three circles, by definition, is your unique ability. Now, I would add a different circle for the blue one. I would say, it helps people when I do it. And in the middle of those three circles, your unique ability, focus your energy there. How do you do it? Download the Passion Workbook. It'll get you started. Basically, it comes down to this. Some simple questions. After you go through the work, it comes down to, I love doing this. I hate doing this. I'm great at this. I suck at this. This makes me money. This costs me money. Do more of this. Do less of this. It's really simple. But to make it complicated, we'll give you a spreadsheet and a whole bunch of stuff that you want to do. Life is simple, folks. Don't overcomplicate it. Oh, and by the way, great tool. Great tool. Robert also mentioned this the other day. Three parts of the human mind. I'm not going to go through the whole psychology with you here, but there's three parts of the mind. There's the cognitive mind. There's the affective mind. This is learned ability. This is personality. The third part of the mind is called the conative mind. This is behaviors. This is actions. And this is more important than the other two. The problem with the cognitive mind is that there's been no way to quantify the cognitive mind until recently. Okay? We can quantify cognitive very easily. We can quantify affective very easily. There's 200 personality tests. There's only one cognitive test, one instinct test, one behavior test. It's called the Colby A index, and you need to take it. How many of you have taken a Colby test? If you've seen me before, you've heard me talk about the Colby. If you haven't taken the Colby, you need to do this immediately when you get back. Don't go another day without doing this. I've done this now with over 14,000 financial advisors, and I will tell you that it's the single most powerful tool I've ever found. The Colby costs you 50 bucks. Be the best 50 bucks you ever spent. I don't get any part of the 50 bucks, all right? You take the Colby test, it's a 36 question test. You go right online. You can take it either on my website or on the Colby website, K O L B E dot com. If you do it on my website, I will get a copy of your Colby scores, and then I will contact you, and we will do a free Colby consultation, and I will tell you what your Colby scores mean for success in the financial services industry. Because I understand Colby, I'm a certified Colby expert. And I understand a little bit about this business, and I will connect the dots for you. And if you haven't had the connect the dots conversation, we really should do that. If you took the Colby someplace else, and you haven't had a financial person who understands this explain it to you, I'd be more than happy to do that. And it's free. It's free. Simple, OK? Very easy to do. The Colby measures four things. Not going to go into detail on what this is. Fact finder, follow through, quick start, implementer. And by the way, when you get your Colby scores, they're yours forever. They don't change. They're permanent hardwired scores. Personality changes a lot. The Myers-Briggs is the most popular personality test in the world. It has a 40% retest validity over four weeks. Look at that other ship out there. It was very close to that other ship. Let's ram them. Let's hit them. I think we could sink them very easily. We're much bigger than them. That's like a private yacht. Well, they'll probably kick our butts. They're, they're smaller, but isn't that nice? You don't see too many ships passing in the night. Ships passing in the day. That's very nice. Here is, this, just, just to give you a little background, all right? I said uh, Myers-Briggs, 40% over four weeks. What does that mean? You take a Myers-Briggs, take it a month later, you've got a 60% chance of getting different scores. Personality shifts. Colby, 90% retest validity over 10 years. Take it today, take it a decade later, 
90% chance you get the same scores. Permanent hardwired characteristics. Don't go another day and don't ever hire anybody. Don't ever hire anybody for your team unless you put them through Colby. Colby tells you what you're going to get. Not what they say they're going to give you. Not what the resume says they've done. Colby is x-ray vision right into their soul, and it tells you what this person will do on the job. Have you ever noticed you hire somebody six months later, you're looking at them going, what the hell happened to you? Who are you? Thought you could do it. Don't do it. This helps you tremendously. Uh, the Colby people met with the University of Arizona Brain Lab, put them on EEG machines. Watch this. This is big. The EEG, electroencephalograph, measures brain waves. They took the people and they made them do tasks that the Colby test predicted they would be good at, and they got a brain pattern. The brain pattern came out like this. And the brain scientists, who didn't know anything about Colby, they're just brain scientists, they said, oh, okay, this is smooth function, this is efficient, low stress, very effective use of brain power. These people are in the zone. They took the same people, they hooked them up to the machines, they made them do things that the Colby test predicted they would suck at, and this is what they got. And the brain scientist said, oh my God, did you give them drugs? Because these people are struggling. They are highly chaotic, inefficient, high stress, ineffective, and their brains were dithering, jumping around from one thing to another, and they couldn't solve the problems. This is real stuff, folks. This is real hard science. This is not fictitious. Your instinctive natural strengths are things that are inside you and that you've had for your entire life. They will be your allies and your friends for the rest of your life, and you've got to find out what they are. Now, the good news is you probably know what your strengths are to some degree. You probably have a pretty good handle on what you're good at. You wouldn't be here if you didn't understand something about yourself. This will quantify it, and we'll take it to the next level. Very, very powerful. Please take the Colby test. It'll make a big difference for you, and I'll help you if I can. This is you using your natural strengths, violating your natural strengths. Okay, how am I, how am I doing on time? Good? Okay, give me a, seven minutes? All right, so skip everything here. <laughs> skip, skip. Um, one of the things we talk about to lifeguards is you need to be disciplined. Lifeguards need discipline. You have to learn how to set goals. We're still in the beginning of the year when goal setting is a popular activity for financial professionals. We're setting our annual goals. Let me make a strong suggestion to you. Number one, listen to my podcast on goal setting. I have a podcast now because I'm clever and I'm in the new era, right? Podcasting. I did a podcasting on how to set goals. My theory is you only set goals on things that you can control. If you set goals on things you can't control, what happens to you? You fail. Not, not only fail, but you get frustrated really quickly. So I set goals on one variable. And there are many variables that lead to success. I get it. Many things that lead to success in our profession. But the only thing that I set goals on is activity. Activity drives everything else. So I focus on how many specific activities am I going to do. How many of you do seminars? Seminars a big deal? OK, good. How many are you, is anybody doing 20 seminars a year or more? This is nice. That's a big number. Anybody still kind of bouncing around the four or five seminar mark? You know what? Let's set a new goal. Let's, let's get more aggressive. Instead of one a quarter, let's do one a month. Can we bump that up? And we'll teach you, we will teach you how to set realistic but stretchy kind of goals. Setting goals is a lot like working out. They tell me I don't work out, so I don't really know. But I know I actually did. I hired a trainer to come to my house to train me. And the first thing she said to me was, get down and do a push-up. Okay. Push-up. Come on. I was in the Army. I did thousands of I could do a push-up. I did a push-up. Push-up. She says, OK, now do a real push-up. Well, it's just a push-up. I just did a push-up. She said, no, you didn't do a push-up. First of all, keeping your knees on the ground apparently doesn't count as a, I didn't know, it seemed like a good thing to me. So I, I could not do, I could, by her standards, I could not do a friggin' push-up. And so what she had was a baseline, a baseline of pretty close to zero. You know, she's, you're not in shape, so we've got to start out slow. Now, what if, what if I had a, the wrong kind of trainer come to my home, okay, we're going to pump some iron, let's get those biceps going. And I would have gotten excited, and I would have, you know, the adrenaline would have kicked in, and what would have happened? I would have hurt myself, and I would not have come back, okay? When you set goals that are too far out, your subconscious goes, wait a minute, we can't do this. Stop it, you're hurting us. Skip the whole goal-setting mechanism. 
When you set goals that are too low, your subconscious pushes you harder. And that's also a risk because you could give up on the low side too. One push-up a day, that ain't much of a workout. I'm not paying you 60 bucks to get me to do one push-up. So there needs to be a zone in there. What's your zone? What is your comfort zone for activity? We'll help you find it, all right? I like the rule of two, two appointments a day, two work nights per week, two Saturdays per month. Oh, why, do any of you work nights and Saturdays? Oh, I don't work nights and Saturdays. I'm a successful professional. I like my time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stop. You're thinking like a salesperson. Stop. They don't stop drowning at 5 o'clock. And they don't stop drowning on weekends. They're drowning all the time. You need to be putting in some time right now. This is a window of opportunity in our profession that's extraordinary. And we have this thing called the life balance wheel. Have you seen this? Okay, you probably have seen, you've got to balance your life, all the different things in your life. And, and they all need equal focus. This is crap. This is pure crap. Right now, unbalance the wheel. Work. For the next year, I want you to bust your butt. Why? Because they're drowning and they need you. And you've got to make a decision. You're either a lifeguard or you're not. It's your choice. You don't have to. I'm not, you can be very successful and not ascribe to any of these beliefs. But if you're going to be a lifeguard, there's one big rule of being a lifeguard in addition to the other 10 that actually transcends the other 10. Before you can be a lifeguard, you have to be willing to do something, which is what? M more generically than that. You have to be willing to get wet. If you're not willing to get in the water and reach out and save people's lives, then what kind of a lifeguard are you? I talk to lots of Wall Street advisors, all right? That's my natural marketplace. I get them, they get me, all right? We, I'm in a big meeting, and I'm talking to Merrill Lynch or Smith Barney or whoever. The, Smith Barney's gone now. Morgan Stanley took them over. Whoever they are, what I see are a lot of advisors, a lot of financial professionals who are lifeguarding like this. Here's the water. Here are my existing clients. I've already got clients. And basically, I'm looking at the water going, hmm, how you guys doing? Everybody OK? Need another blanket? Cup of coffee? Yeah, I hear them screaming. They'll all be dead in a little while. I'm more worried about you. They're focusing on what they have, and they think that keeping what they have is a victory. Meanwhile, 20 feet off the shore, 70 million Americans are dying. You got to be willing to get in the water. If you're not marketing, you're not a lifeguard, by definition. OK. How do you take advantage of any of this? Download a bunch of stuff from my website. I guarantee it'll help you. Skip through all of this. I just want to show you a couple, one more thing that'll help you tremendously. Skip, 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 skip. Download the psychological interview. Very useful. Your ability to ask questions, more useful than your ability to talk. Your ability to listen, download the active listening guide. Your ability to listen to people intently with passion and conviction, listening with conviction. Oh my God, does listening take attention and energy? Does listening take energy? Or is it a passive process for you? I come home from work, I see my wife and I go into passive listening mode. Passive listening mode. Hi honey, how was your day? And then I kind of slip into neutral and I just relax because when you ask Rebecca how the day was, you're gonna get the whole day. In chronological sequence, well, this morning, this, then, then this, I took the kids to school, but I didn't want the whole day. I kind of wanted the short report. You know, fine, good day, here's food. That's it. I would have been happy with that. Now, this is interesting. What if I want a good relationship with my wife? Which, you know, you can make the case that's not a bad idea two or three times a month. You want a decent relationship with your wife. So I go to active listening mode. Active listening. Watch closely. Active listening. Hi, honey. How was your day? And then I take off my glasses. This is a very powerful gesture. If you don't have glasses, get them. You can't, <laughs> you can't pop out of contact lens. It's not the same thing. Hi, honey. How was your day? And then I take off my glasses, and I look right into her eyes, and I shut up, and I don't interrupt her, and I don't try to solve her problem. Oh, here's what you did wrong. Well, you know, next time. Do you no, I, I use reflective and supportive language. Wow, really? Interesting. Isn't that something? Yeah, tell me more about that, honey. Tell me more. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The, the pain is extraordinary. But she walks away from that conversation going, you really care. You really, 
you know, it's like George Burns said, acting is all about sincerity. And when you can fake that, you got it made. <laughs> a lot of stuff. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate being here. The last thought I'll leave you is this, OK? This is a strange time in our profession. I think, I think, and again, I don't know specifics about you. I don't, I don't know the kind of business you do. I have a general idea. And the fact that most of you don't work at wirehouses gives me some, some conviction that I'm in the right zone here. I think saving people's lives is much more valuable than selling them products. And I think the entire Wall Street model that has been geared for so many years toward pitching risk, toward pitching growth, toward pitching some, some fake dream of success that has absolutely crippled an entire generation is so toxic that we've got to move away from that. I think you are at the leading edge of this change. I really believe that. I mean, and, and if you can shift a slight piece of your thinking in the morning, instead of saying, how much am I going to sell this month? How much am I going to sell today? Different question. How many lives am I going to save today? That's the business we're in. Stop selling. Start saving lives. You're doing it already. This will help you think a new way. Thank you for today. Have a great time. We're done. Thank you. Thanks, Kit. Thank you, Frank.